Chris Mikowski of Emerging Civil War. I'm in Galveston, Texas, at the gravesite of Prince John Magruder. You can see behind me there. Um, a little windy. There's a weed whacker in the background, so we'll see how we make out here today. But I apologize for any noise that might be in the background. Magruder was a Virginia native, born in Port Royal in 1808. Went on to West Point, graduated in the class of 1830. He was 15 out of 43. Goes on to the second lieutenant, serves in the Mexican War, uh, instrumental in uh, some of the first shots of our Chapultepec, uh, but then just, uh, and he sticks with the army. But then, um, just four days after Virginia votes to secede uh, to join the Confederacy, Magruder gives up his commission with the United States Army and goes with the South. Uh, Virginia Governor John Letcher appoints him a colonel. And he will eventually be posted to defend Richmond uh, because, of course, the, uh, the Confederate government's worried about some sort of movement up the Virginia Peninsula. Now, this is 1861 still, and uh, Magruder sets up defenses out there and uh, eventually becomes a Brigadier General. He will foil a movement by Benjamin Butler from Fort Monroe upward toward Yorktown, where Magruder's going to basically have his headquarters, and uh, at the Battle of Big Bethel, June 10th, 1861, he will foil Butler's movement. That makes him one of the early uh, heroes of the Confederacy. Uh, Douglas L. Freeman said that behind PGT Beauregard, uh, Magruder was like the top guy in the Confederacy at that point. Then Second Manassas comes in July, and things change around a little bit uh, uh, after that as far as who's the hero and who's not. So Magruder will stay in charge uh, on the peninsula, and when George McClellan moves his forces down there and starts moving up from Fort Monroe in the spring of 1862, it'll be up to Magruder to try to foil him. Um, he will use tremendous theatrics, uh, something he was very interested in himself as an amateur fan of theater, and uh, you know, contributes to his Prince John nickname because he was much into the trappings of the office and uh, you know the whole costume and pageantry of it all. And he is going to move uh, his two divisions back and forth and uh, make it sound as though he's got a lot more uh, men than he really does. And that's going to do a lot to foil George McClellan in April of 62 as he's moving up. That buys Joe Johnston time to shift down from the areas around Manassas to the Virginia Peninsula. And he will take over because, of course, he outranks Magruder. Um, Magruder will do a good job helping with the fallback toward Richmond. He knows uh, the defenses, but in fact, because of his familiarity, uh, he's not there at the Battle of Williamsburg. He, his um, men don't know the uh, defenses that he set up there, and so uh, his forces are driven back, and better forces are driven out of Williamsburg uh, fairly easily. And uh, Joe Johnson will be a little bitter that Magruder wasn't there. He was on uh, Johnson-approved medical leave uh, for a few days, actually. So things will uh, settle in. Um, Johnson will get replaced by Lee. Magruder uh, will then be one of the division commanders that Lee will depend on, but he won't perform especially well. Uh, he'll harass the rear of the Union retreat at Savage Station, not do a particularly do, do a good job there. And then he will be slow in moving in the pursuit and eventually not have very good days at Fraser's Farm or Glendale, as it's also known, um, or again at Malvern Hill. Now, a lot of this isn't his fault. Uh, Lee orders a lot of people to communicate and coordinate with each other. Things don't go well for a lot of them. Stonewall Jackson, for instance, as you know, does not have an especially good day during the seven days. Um, but Magruder's going to end up taking a lot of the brunt of the scapegoating for that. He and, and Philop Philop Theophilus Holmes will get scapegoated by Lee. And uh, what does Lee typically do? He sends people west. And so Magruder will actually be cleared of some suspicions of drunkenness. Uh, Lee won't even back those up. Um, so he'll get shifted out to the Trans-Mississippi. We'll be, he'll be in charge of the departments of Texas, uh, New Mexico, and Arizona. He comes out here, makes a pretty big splash. We're on the island, uh, so I suppose that's a good thing. Uh, Galveston had fallen uh, in October of 1862, and when Magruder shows up, he's gonna come up with a plan to uh, recapture the city, which he'll do on January 1st, 1863, even as, for instance, uh, Rosecrans is finally rebuffing those final assaults at Stones River, which is the action we tend to think of on, um, uh, on the 1st of January, 1863, Magruder recaptures this seaport, which is really useful for the Confederacy down here along the Gulf. Eventually, he'll have to 
uh, surrender Confederate forces here on the USS Fort Jackson out in Galveston Bay, the second to last uh, formal Confederate surrender, followed only by Stan Waddy um, out at uh, Fort Towson. And uh, so that will essentially bring things to an end here in June of 1865 in the Trans-Mississippi. And then just a few days later, uh, Gordon Granger will come into town and issue what becomes the Juneteenth Order. Um, Magruder will flee to Mexico. He'll sign up with Maximilian, run into some misfortune there. He'll flee to Cuba, eventually making it back in the late 1860s uh, to the United States. He's broke. He tries to set up a law practice, doesn't do well, goes on a speaking tour, which does does a little bit better, but in 1871, he's going to find himself back in Houston, Texas, where he had once had his headquarters, and uh, he will then die after uh, a few weeks worth of illness. Uh, but residents in Galveston pull together a collection and have him moved here to Galveston and have him reinterred in the Episcopal Cemetery here. So I'm standing in Trinity Episcopal Cemetery, the city old cemetery just across the, uh, the way from me there. And so here is why John Magruder's here. The folks in Galveston saw him as a savior of the city for lifting uh, the, uh, the blockade and the siege. And so here the Virginia native rests in Galveston, Texas. Beautiful little cemetery, uh, great, great stuff to explore here. For Emerging Civil War, I'm Chris Mikowski. We'll see you online on the battlefield then in some cool old cemeteries.